know, there are a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of people that are not health experts, they're not doctors, but they play doctors on social media. So let's get the real deal. Let's get the real answers from a man who is very well respected in the medical field. He's the infectious disease specialist, University of Virginia. Very happy to have him on the show right now. Dr. Patrick Jackson. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Appreciate, appreciate you coming on. I want to ask you this first question because we've been debating this the last segment and my co-host JD is talking. How can someone test negative and then test positive? Can you talk about that testing and, and, and can you give us a little bit of detail on that? Yeah, there's a number of ways that can happen. So any test that you perform has uh, what's called a, a sensitivity to it. Uh, some tests are more sensitive than others, uh, which means that for any test that you perform, there's always going to be a certain false negative rate. Uh, that can be affected by the test itself. It can be affected by how well you do the swab. If any of your listeners have ever had a nasal swab done uh, for COVID-19, uh, you can imagine that a better swab that gets farther up there and, and kind of stays longer is going to be a better test than a, than a less good swab. We also know that people who test positive uh, can persistently have some low levels of RNA for weeks or even months after their initial positive. And that can go positive, negative, positive, negative, just as that fluctuates over uh, the level of sensitivity for the test. Gotcha. Okay, so explain to people last week uh, at the Rose Garden, a lot of people are calling this a super spreader event. As you know, doctor, a lot of people were not wearing masks. A lot of people were not social distancing. If all those people tested negative, and I would assume they did, just explain to our audience how that's possible and how they could have still spread the virus. Well, so, uh, again, if, if someone had a low level of positivity or the test that they received um, was uh, kind of just barely below the limit of detection, uh, then the test might have been essentially a, a false negative. Right. Uh, it also kind of depends on the timing. You can test negative yesterday, but then start shedding virus today. Uh, so depending on the timing of when those negative tests were performed in advance of the event, uh, that might not have predicted whether they were actually shedding virus at the event itself. Gotcha. So if, if you are, if, if you test, <clears throat> if you test negative and you're actually positive, are you, are you actually contagious at that point, despite the fact that you have that low level of positivity? You would expect that someone with a, a very low level of positivity or, or, you know, you might interpret that as a high CP value, something that you might see uh, listed would be less infectious. Um, uh, but again, you know, the, the level of uh, sensitivity of the test varies depending on the test that you're using. The quality of sampling uh, can vary. And so it is possible that someone who is highly infectious might have a false negative test. So just that the number of false negative tests is, is low. Um, but again, this is an evolving virus. And the different test platforms that are being used all have kind of different levels of false negativity. So then, so do you, because you looked at the, the Republican National Convention, that was, that was attended by many more than actually attended this Rose Garden event. And I'm sure everyone tested negative that was there. And there was no cases that resulted from that. Do you think that, that the virus has mutated or, or something in the last two months? And that's why there, there was at least one false negative? We think that probably events where you have a large number of positives uh, coming through are more have more have to do with, with the individual that's infected than with the virus evolving. Well, this virus does evolve to a, uh, to a certain extent. It's much less uh, likely to mutate than other viruses that we're familiar with, like HIV, for example. Um, so it is probable that, that you simply have individuals... Um, uh, who, for whatever reason, have a high level of virus in their nasal passages uh, and who are also maybe engaging in certain behaviors um, that promote the spread. Uh, so, you know, people who are kind of separated in an auditorium might be at lower risk uh, than people who are, you know, shaking hands and hugging and sure, along sure. those lines. So, Dr. Jackson, let's talk a little bit about Donald Trump and everything that you know. And I understand you don't have all the information that the doctors have. First of all, as a doctor, as somebody that has been in the medical field for a long time, how did you feel when these doctors held these press conferences, they did not release the information on Saturday about him being on oxygen. And then the next day they said they were trying to be positive about And it, I mean, as a doctor yourself, do you think that hurts another doctor's credibility uh, when you see that happening? What did you make of that as a doctor yourself? I, I thought that was pretty disappointing. I mean, as a physician, we have an obligation to privacy for our patients. Uh, but I think that uh, that obligation means that you can not give information, but giving incorrect information uh, really does hurt your credibility down the line. Uh, you know, when you're the physician for a public figure uh, whose health and well-being is a matter of public policy and public interest, uh, you know, that's just another layer of, of obligation to tell the truth. But I think uh, releasing incorrect information about any patient uh, after you've been given permission to do so uh, would be, you know, 
inappropriate. Agree. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Dr. Patrick Jackson, infectious disease specialist at the University of Virginia. Okay, doctor, let's talk about some of the drugs that the president is on, uh, particularly remdesivir. Now, I'm not a doctor, but my understanding, and you correct me if I'm wrong, this is administered for five days only in a hospital, and my understanding is you're really not allowed to be admitted out of the hospital when taking this drug. So what do you make of him, by him, the president of the United States, leaving Walter Reed Medical Center and still being administered some of these experimental drugs? What do you make of that? Yeah, well, so uh, the University of Virginia was actually part of the original studies that showed that remdesivir was effective. So I actually have a fair amount of experience uh, with that medication. The original studies were to administer remdesivir, which is only available through an IV, uh, for five or ten days uh, during a person's hospitalization, and essentially to stop it when they're well enough to be discharged uh, from the hospital. Uh, So I think the idea of continuing remdesivir for a patient that you're saying is well enough to be discharged is a little bit unusual, uh, um, sort of thing to do. That we certainly are not sending our patients back to their houses receiving this IV medication. Gotcha. It seems to be a relatively safe drug, but there certainly is some lab monitoring that needs to be done as well. So the fact that the doctors put President Trump on all these different types of drugs, the facts that he was on oxygen for a couple days, where do you? Th- I mean, I know this is a very difficult question for you to answer because you don't have all the information. But based on what you do know from the press conferences, from the drugs that the president is on. Wouldn't that lead you to believe that this is not, uh, you know, just a precautionary matter, that they thought that it was more serious, his state of condition? I would think so. So dexamethasone, the the steroid that he received as well, is a drug that's really reserved for serious or critical uh, cases of COVID-19 and actually has the potential to be harmful in patients who are less seriously ill. Um, You know, the thing that I thought was was really unusual is the idea that you would put someone on steroids for COVID-19 and then immediately discharge them from the hospital. You know, in my practice, if I think a patient is sick enough from COVID-19 to require steroids, I'm definitely not considering discharging them in the next day. If I think a patient is well enough to be discharged tomorrow, uh, then they're too well to receive steroids. Uh, So really, those two things together, the steroids and rapid discharge, are difficult to reconcile. One possibility may be that they've been able to set up the White House in such a way that this discharge from Walter Reed really is uh, essentially to another hospital-like environment where he can get that level of monitoring. Uh, But certainly, uh, this would not be a reasonable sort of approach to take for someone, uh, for most of our patients, who would be like actually going home. So, so President Trump was positive for the first time on Thursday night. This vi- does, does this virus really a- attack? I mean, I realize he's 74 years old. I realize he is considered obese, and he's, he's high risk in, in two areas. But does this virus really attack someone's immune system that quickly? Because I, I, he was, if he was on oxygen the next day and he was critically ill within two days— I, I mean, I, I haven't, and again, I'm obviously not a doctor, but I haven't heard of the virus moving that quickly. Have you? There's a lot of variation. Um, the, the median time between the first start of symptoms and a person getting hospitalized is somewhere in the range of seven to 10 days. Uh, so getting hospitalized so rapidly is a little bit unusual, uh, but I would say that that's kind of on the bell curve. We've seen patients who get quite sick uh, very early on in their course. We also see patients who only get sick you know, two weeks out uh, from their initial onset of symptoms. Uh, so everyone's a little bit different, and, and I wouldn't uh, say that this is dramatically um, out of the ordinary. As a doctor, I want to ask you your thoughts on this, because President Trump's tweeted something out this morning that has since been taken down from Twitter. And, doctor, I don't want to go through all the tweets with you, and I don't want to make this political, but I do want to read this tweet because I think it's important. Again, this is a man who is still positive with this virus. Donald Trump this morning said, quote, Flu season is coming up. Many people every year, sometimes over 100,000, and despite the vaccine, die from the flu. Are we going to close down our country? No. We have learned to live with it, just like we are learning to live with COVID in most populations, far less lethal. The president just said in most populations that COVID is far less lethal than having the flu. What do you say to that, doctor, as an infectious disease specialist? I would say that that's almost certainly not correct, that our understanding of the uh, case fatality rate um, for COVID-19 is that it's somewhere in the range of three to 10 times more lethal uh, than influenza. Um, so, so I think that that's, that's simply not correct. It also is the case that we have uh, vaccines for influenza. We also have a certain level of population immunity, given the fact that influenza circulates through our, through our population on a regular basis. Uh, and so we have some antibodies left that may react the flu virus circulating this year, and that can attenuate um, the severity of influenza, whereas a novel coronavirus is novel. uh, And, you know, we would expect that 
uh, we, we simply don't have that, that level of population immunity. And as of right now, we don't have a vaccine. Right. That makes complete sense. So, doctor, I mean, as you know, and I'm sure you would you, you would you tell your patients social distance, wear a mask. I mean, when the leader of the free world makes a statement and an incorrect statement like that, as you just said, it's three to ten times more deadly than the, the flu. Uh, I, I would imagine that there's going to be some people out there that won't listen to, sadly, scientists and doctors like yourself and will listen to the president of the United States that will go out there and not practice social distancing and will listen to the words that the president says. So I want to I want the people to hear from you, doctor. How serious is this virus uh, is, you know, how irresponsible is it? to go outside, not wear a mask, not practice social distancing. How irresponsible is it, doctor? For example, uh, go to a campaign rally. It could be a, a Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I don't care where it is. Going to a rally, not wearing a mask, and not being a six feet distance from other people. How dangerous is that, and how dangerous is this virus? We want to hear it from you. Well, you know, uh, the virus has a wide range of uh, of levels of severity. Many people who get the virus are completely asymptomatic. Other people who get the virus die from the virus, right? Uh, So I think the idea is that you need to protect yourself and you need to protect the people around you because you don't know who's going to have a bad outcome from it. Right. Um, You know, in my life, I wear a mask consistently. I practice social distancing consistently. I've not eaten indoors in a restaurant since March. Um, and I'm going to continue those practices because I, I believe that this virus is something that could be detrimental to me, and it could be detrimental to the people who I care about. Uh, and I think that all of my infectious disease colleagues are, are practicing the same way. Um, so, you know, you, you may or may not believe uh, what I say, but certainly I think the people who know the most about infectious diseases and about viruses are kind of living this uh, yeah. in our lives. Uh, we're certainly not going out and, and uh, you know, having keg parties, uh, you know, in people's houses right, um, right. You know, after, we sign off, after we sign off the work. Uh, we're we're kind of doing the precautions that we need to do, uh, even at the same cost that everyone else is experiencing. Uh, you know, my, my infectious disease colleagues aren't living the lives that, that we would like to be. I have not, you know, seen all the family members that I would like to see. Right. Uh, but I think we have to take this this very seriously. Couldn't agree with you more. No, I try to make this analogy. Some people get it, doctor. Some people don't. And maybe you'll agree with me or not on this. But, you know, I talk about a DUI driver, right? And this is an extreme case. But when you get into your car and you drive drunk, you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting others at risk. And that might be an extreme case, and I understand that's against the law to uh, drink and drive. But I, I make that analogy to what we're doing here. I feel like, doctor, when you're out there in public, you refuse to wear a mask, you refuse to social distance, whether you think you're sick or not, you're still putting everybody else at risk. And I try to make that analogy. Do, do you agree with that to an extent, the analogy I'm trying to make? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, with, with all uh, contagious diseases, uh, we, 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 we all live in, this, in the same society and we all, you know, kind of our risk uh, really depends on what everyone else uh, is doing. Um, you know, I am uh, a relatively healthy individual. I'm not, you know, terribly concerned that I would be at high risk of having a bad outcome. Uh, but members of my family um, aren't, uh, aren't in that situation. And so, you know, part of the reason why I'm so stringent about wearing a mask and social distancing is to protect them. Uh, we also don't know uh, the people around us, the person at the grocery store, you know, across the aisle from you. You don't know their medical history. Uh, and so it, I think it only makes sense uh, to, to practice uh, safe, you know, uh, safe social distancing and, and masking uh, to protect people that you might not even know and you don't know what their risk factors look like. In my in my response, and Brian and I had this argument on a very consistent basis. If you're in front of a drunk driver and you get approached by a drunk driver, I mean, if their car, I mean, no matter what, you are you are at risk of, of your life either ending or you being seriously incapacitated if you get hit by a car, you know, driven by a drunk driver, considering that a car weighs you know two tons in most cases. But with COVID nineteen, unless you're high risk group, you, you could be someone someone around you could have COVID nineteen, and for example, I'm, I'm 35 years old. I'm not overweight. I don't have any type of health conditions. I don't. I don't have any comorbidities or, or any any pre-existing conditions. If someone was around me with COVID-19 and and I got it, I I would not. There, there's there, there's a much smaller chance, a significantly smaller chance that I would actually be negatively affected as opposed to me being hit by a car by a drunk driver. Do you see what I'm saying there, doctor? You know, I, I would make two arguments about that. One is that every time an individual is exposed to COVID-19, you're rolling the dice. Uh, and, you know, those dice might be differently weighted, right? If you're a, a young, healthy person, uh, the chances are you'll make it out of there okay. But it's not a guarantee. 
And certainly I have admitted young, healthy people to our intensive care unit uh, and taken care of them with, with really severe illnesses. Uh, it's obviously more likely to happen if you are older or have comorbidities, but it's certainly not 100 percent safe. The other thing is that we don't really know what the long term effects of this virus are going to be. Uh, it's even in, in patients who are asymptomatic, there's at least some emerging data uh, that, that mild cases of illness or even uh, cases of illness where the person doesn't recognize that they're sick may have some long term consequences. I think until we have that data, it makes a lot of sense to be on the more cautious side. Uh, even if you think that you're healthy and you're gonna you're you're, you're gonna win that roll of the dice, doctor. This is interesting because I haven't really talked to anyone about this. Can you give me a few examples, perhaps, a uh, uh, somebody that you studied that was asymptomatic that didn't even know they had the virus, and now they're suffering months later? Can, can you can you explain to me maybe an instance or two of what you're talking about? Well, you know, I think there's kind of two groups of people that that we're talking about. There are the folks who had uh, you know moderate or mild illnesses. Uh, who continue to have respiratory issues, continue to have low levels of energy, you'd have difficulties with their sense of smell and taste. Uh, some people are calling them the long-haul uh, patients. We really don't understand the reason why these folks are having such a difficult time recovering from their illness. Uh, but I would say a lot of the patients that I talk to, you know, even uh, weeks out uh, from their initial illness, just tell me how much di- more difficult it is to recover and get back to the usual level of functioning than they expected. There's an additional level of data, and I would say that this is all you know, fairly speculative and, and the data is really emerging, of doing things like imaging the hearts of young athletes uh, who've been infected with COVID-19 and seeing some signal abnormalities uh, in those heart imaging. We really don't know the significance of that, but I think there's at least a, a level of evidence that suggests that this virus may have more effects than we currently recognize. Gotcha. Yep. And it's possible that those effects may cause some long-term negative consequences, but mm-hmm. we don't know that for sure. So, Doctor, a lot of people uh, were speculating about hydroxychloroquine. I found it very interesting, and we hear the gold star standard, right? We hear Dr. Fauci and other scientists and doctors talk about that. There just wasn't enough there, and, and the studies that were there did not show that hydroxychloroquine was a sufficient drug that would help cure the coronavirus or help people with the coronavirus. So they haven't administered that to the president of the United States. I find that very telling because if it worked, I'm sure they would give it to him. But yet the president has been you know, promoting this drug for months now. What can you tell us about hydroxychloroquine? And doesn't that speak volumes that they haven't administered it to the president? I think it does. You know, hydroxychloroquine is uh, a drug that in the test tube uh, against a number of viruses and early on, uh, when we had no alternative therapies, uh, I, was very, I was quite hopeful that hydroxychloroquine would be beneficial. And we even talked about using that uh, at our hospital, um, you know, in the very early days. Unfortunately, it hasn't panned out uh, in the literature, um, which, you know, I, I regret as well, because it'd be great to have such a cheap, widely effective, uh, you know, widely available drug. Um, the fact that it's not effective is a huge disappointment, but we have to kind of bow to the reality um, of that. I, I do agree. I think the doctors that uh, President Trump uh, has seen at Walter Reed are, are highly qualified, likely know the literature as well as anyone. They certainly can get anyone on the phone that they would like. And I think it seems like they are persuaded, as most of the rest of us are persuaded, that hydroxychloroquine is not going to be a useful drug for treatment. Why is remdesivir 400 times more expensive than hydroxychloroquine, doctor? <laughs> you would have to ask someone from Gilead that. Um, it is a... Uh, it's not a new medication in terms of the chemistry, but certainly has never been FDA approved. Um, uh, I am very disappointed that Gilead has opted to make that drug uh, so expensive, uh, which is obviously going to limit its availability in the United States and around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, the data shows that it does reduce time to uh, to patients getting better from COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have been using it for hospitalized patients. Um, this is only one of many drugs that I'd like mm-hmm. to ask Gilead about why they're pricing it the way they are, though. A couple more quick questions for you, Dr. Jackson, and we really do appreciate your time. I uh, really do. Uh, so I, I got to ask you this, doctor, because it offended me, and I can't imagine, I, I would imagine it offended a lot of doctors around the country. I'm talking about Dr. Stella Emanuel, and I use that term doctor very loosely, right? This is the doctor that talked about demon sperm. She talked about uh, women that can be impregnated in their sleep. And yet the president of the United States not only retweeted her, but, uh, you know, basically gave her credibility. As a, as a doctor yourself, how does that make you feel when you see the leader of the free world giving somebody like that, you know, any type of respect at all or credibility? It makes our lives much more difficult. You know, in this pandemic, in a lot of cases, we've been in a really difficult position of telling people, we don't know why you're having that particular symptom or uh, we don't know what the best treatment is in this particular condition. And if we're honest to our patients, that's really what we ought to be doing. Right. But if, on the other hand, you have someone giving easy answers, even if those answers are incorrect, 
uh, it can be a lot more difficult to have this conversation with patients. It can be but a lot I'm more a real doctor. To have confidence in us. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just really disappointing. I, I, this happens with a lot of diseases, however, um, and I think it's important that, you know, when people hear something that sounds too good to be true in the news, that they talk to someone that they trust about it, someone who has actual expertise and really go through the evidence. Exactly. And yeah, I noticed that uh, Donald Trump did not hire Dr. Stella Emanuel to treat him. I wonder why that is. OK, so, doctor, I have to I have to ask you this question, OK, because we're talking about the quote unquote President Trump's joyride. OK, we all know, I think most of us understand uh, how he put some of his people in the Secret Service at risk. But I want to hear it from you, doctor. I want to hear your opinions on that joyride. He's still a patient. He's still positive for covid. How dangerous is that, what the president did? Would you call it reckless like some others are? You know, when I go in to see a patient who has active COVID-19, I wear full personal protective equipment, a gown, an N95 mask, eye protection, gloves. And I also don't go into the rooms of those patients unless I have a reason to actually be in there. If I'm doing something that actually benefits them or monitoring something that needs to be monitored, we don't go in just for fun because every time you expose yourself into one of those environments, there is a small risk that you could become infected. Uh, so I certainly would not have gone into that, uh, into that small car uh, with the president. And I think that kind of uh, the president exposing, potentially exposing people, even if they're wearing appropriate PPE, for something that didn't need to be done is, is inappropriate. Why, I agree with you. Why won't they? Why won't the doctors tell the American public about what they saw in his lungs? Why won't they give us those sort of details? You know, from a doctor's standpoint, why won't they tell us when his first test was? I mean, they're not giving us any of that information. And my question is, why, doctor? Do you think that these doctors at Walter Reed are being pressured? Uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't say. I, I will say that every physician has an obligation to their the patient that's in front of them. And part of that obligation of the patient in front of you is to protect their privacy. Uh, so I will say that if I were one of those Walter Reed doctors and my patient, even if they were the president of the United States, told me not to release information, mm -hmm. I wouldn't lie to anyone. Right. Uh, but I would keep confidential the things I was supposed to keep confidential. I think there's a separate question Understood. about what obligation the president has to release information uh, to the public. But that's probably not the obligation of his sure. doctors. Doctor, I think we always want doctors to have their first obligation to the person who's in front of them. Um, absolutely. So. I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. Doctor, this will be my last question for you. If you had a chance right now with your expertise to sit across the table from the president of the United States and have a private conversation with him, what would you, what would you say? You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we have all made is thinking about this virus as an enemy. A virus doesn't think, it doesn't feel, it doesn't care about you and me. It's not, uh, it, you know, it's not an outside invader. It's a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a wildfire. And I think in the face of a wildfire coming down a canyon towards you, there's no place there for courage or defiance or domination or fear. What you have to do is understand the risk in front of you and take appropriate action to protect yourself and to protect other people. Uh, and I, I really wish that we could kind of understand this virus not as something to be defied or dominated, but as something that we really need to understand as a real threat to people around us and to take those rational steps. Um, you know, I think, I, I think too much, uh, there's been too much emphasis on um, uh, displaying, uh, you know, uh, his courage uh, and his strength. And I don't think that has much much role to play uh, when what you're facing is a natural disaster. And, Doctor, my last question for you. There have been 70,000 college students infected with COVID-19 nationwide, and only three have been hospitalized. Why do you think that is? I think that in younger uh, populations, uh, you know, the risk of bad outcomes is certainly lower. Um, and I'm really happy that, that so few college students have been admitted uh, with COVID-19. I think that uh, two things on that is that, you know, we don't know uh, what the effect uh, of those infections of college students have had on the surrounding communities, uh, on the, the staff uh, who, run those, uh, who run those colleges and universities, et cetera. Uh, so the burden of disease could actually be increased uh, and, and magnified by college students kind of being together and getting infected. And we also don't know uh, what the long-term consequences for all the students are going to be. I certainly hope that they recover fine and have no long-term sequela, but it's probably too early to know that for sure. Well, Doctor, thank you so much for your time. Honestly, I learned a lot from this interview. I really did, and I appreciate your expertise and your time. Thank you so much. I think you're doing a great service to this country by doing these interviews and giving the real information out there. So, Doctor, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Doctor. Thanks.